welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and I'm joined by... Simon Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Erin Kutch Tuzman, Senior Editor. Lauren Martz, Senior Editor. Well, it's our final pod of 2020. 2020, the year we learned how to teach fifth grade math while interviewing Biopharma's brightest minds about COVID countermeasures while they are teaching fifth grade math. Perhaps the thing I least expected going into the year was the immense gratitude I would feel when I learned that Anthony Fauci, a kid from Brooklyn, can't throw a baseball. So we say goodbye to a grueling year. BioCentury's editors have furrowed among the disasters to pick out some of the positives from 2020 and call out some of the worst of the pandemic's collateral damage. And then we are getting out our crystal ball to see where the sun might shine in 2021. So Simone, Lauren, Karen, I'd like to hear from you. What were the best moments for Biopharma in 2020? What were the biggest disappointments? And what are you hoping to see next year? Simone, what's top of mind for you? Let me start by saying several of the editors, not everyone's on this call, but we've all weighed in and there's going to be a piece coming out this week with our picks. Several of us really saw the industry come together in a way it had never done before because biopharma was created in, what do you want to say, the 80s? And there's never been a disaster like this that has really given the industry an opportunity or needed the industry to step in and show the world the value of its day job. So I think a lot of people called that out. Then some of us, and I know Lauren and Karen are going to weigh in. If you dig into the weeds, there are also some other really important ways that we've moved forward. And we're hoping that some of these will actually stick. For me, one of the really big things is that diagnostics, which has really been the sort of poor relation of drug development for a long time, infectious disease diagnostics in particular. And now the whole world is hanging on diagnostics. Everybody needs to get tested. Another highlight for me is that Karen has become a huge expert in all the various methods and we'll be covering these going forward but these have finally got some respect uh, everybody the world over is talking about PCR testing antigen testing and these are household terms that's a really big one for me and I'm really hoping that investment in diagnostics can continue they've shown how important they are even for getting economies back up again so i have a couple of others but i'm going to hand over to the others to to weigh in with theirs karen uh, diagnostics tell us a bit about what you learned over the course of the year now that you're our new dx guru (laughs) well it was really interesting watching kind of the plane get built in real time both in terms of the tests themselves but also in terms of people's understanding of what testing would be important and how. Really early on in the pandemic, obviously there was the need to detect infections. There was a ramping up of production for that. And things like PCR reagents and swabs became these crucial bottlenecks that everyone had to rally around. It was also interesting watching the conversation evolve around what is the testing that you're going to need to reopen society? And at first, everyone was talking about serology. Like, oh, if you can detect antibodies against the virus in people's blood, then you can maybe give them a passport, they can go to work, et cetera. First of all, those tests came out in a way that was pretty variably regulated and FDA first said, we're not regulating them, then we are. And there were some issues there. Also, people kind of quickly realized that, wait, we don't actually know if antibodies mean that you're protected or not. And actually the Infectious Disease Society has said, There's really limited use cases for serology, at at least as of maybe a month or so ago. Then the conversation evolved to actually repeated testing for the virus. The question is how frequently, what sensitivity, et cetera. And and that's still kind of the, the ongoing conversation. And now we've moved into home testing and what are the implications of that? So it's been a really interesting journey and I've been grateful for kind of a front row seat to that and being able to talk to some of the experts in this as the pandemics evolve. Excellent. Lauren, I know that you followed all of the master protocol trials for us across the year, and high on your list was pharma collaboration. 
around COVID countermeasures. Can you expand on that a bit? Yeah, I, Simone sort of mentioned this, but I think it was really cool to see the industry come together to tackle this common problem. There was really an unprecedented collaboration around countermeasures for COVID. We saw companies decide to take their therapies into master protocol trials. And so we got to see on a really big scale, the benefits that those types of trials have for the greater population. I think we're starting to see that these can actually help companies too. The hope is that going forward, this can be applied to other indications and we can achieve some of those efficiencies beyond what we've just seen here for COVID. I think that with these huge pharma and biotech collaborations that we've seen, the infrastructure and the relationships are now in place. And that's a huge positive from this year. The opportunity is just to carry that forward. And I guess we'll see what happens. Lauren, I think it's interesting because when we did this chart for our annual back to school essay, we looked at the number of master protocol trials across different diseases. What we saw was cancer had the largest number. It was more than 20. And in this one year, COVID-related master protocol trials, there were, I think, around 13 or something like that that had been stood up. So that just this year, and that was even by July, August or something. And every other disease had a trickle, had one or two. There were a couple of infectious diseases. There was ALS, a couple of neuro diseases. And I think what we've been looking for is people to recognize, the industry to recognize the power of these trials and the way that they can really expedite drug development, even reduce costs in drug development, be patient sparing. You know, we're really hoping that people will have, I don't know, got their feet wet on this and be willing to try them more in, in other diseases, even after COVID. Back in September, we published our annual back to school issue, and it focused on some of these themes. A couple of others that it focused on was the need to increase diversity in clinical trials, as well as data sharing. And I think I've heard from a lot of my colleagues that these were two areas where we did see some really positive movement this year. I think this was the year, you know, and it was a confluence of things, but this was the year that I think biopharma as an industry and, and a lot of uh, the world got really serious about reckoning with systemic racism, calling it what it is and acknowledging it in its ranks and identifying concrete ways to do better. And this was, of course, in the aftermath of the George Floyd protests, it was really, it was heartening to see our industry do something more than platitudes and pledge to take um, concrete actions. And there are a couple of, you know, things that stood out to me, like Mass Bio, the trade org in the Boston area, they did this pledge, which struck me because it had some really concrete metrics. It said biopharma that sign on to this pledge have to do at least uh, a number of these actions to make their uh, workplaces more diverse, representative, and you know, anti-racist, frankly. Clinical trial recruitment is a big part of the focus of the industry, really acknowledging the glaring gaps there, particularly, and I think in back to school, we did an analysis of diseases where the Black community is disproportionately affected, but then underrepresented in trials. And so, and of course, the COVID crisis itself really magnified what was going on in terms of racial disparities, in terms of access to health care. I think it's something that our industry will never be able to ignore again, and that's important. I agree. I, I think one of the really important things was that the conversation moved beyond just saying, we need to think about staffing and promotions and you know, the internal machinations within companies and in terms of enabling diversity to thinking about concrete things like clinical trials. And I've actually been in conversation with various people. One is an epidemiologist. And I think it's really important that we start to have a conversation. Not everybody agrees about the best way to end up with a better representation, better outcomes is what we really need to be looking for. So everybody agrees on the goal and the importance of it, but some people say you should create every trial with a view to ensuring diversity. 
There's actually another school of thought that says, no, that would make trials completely impossible to run. They'd be huge. And actually, there's an argument to do it this way. And I, I really, that's something we're going to be continuing to watch at Biocentury. Now it's on people's radar. So it's not a question of getting it on people's radar or needing to justify it anymore. Now it's a question of what are the best ways to design trials and strategies in order to achieve equity in health outcomes? All right. And uh, thoughts on data sharing? I, I think data sharing is one of the areas where I've heard different things. On the one hand, people are really glad that it's on the radar and it has really moved forwards. On the other hand, I really think it's inched forwards rather than taking big strides. The same might be true in retrospect about health outcomes and equity across different races. But I know there are some people in the industry who are frustrated that they haven't managed to go further with this. There are others who are pointing to organizations like Transcelerate and these very big consortia that came together that started to share data for COVID-19. The question really is, are they going to share data on anything else? Yeah, one of the things that was sort of disappointing was seeing how little there seems to be in terms of harmonizing, it's sort of on the continuum of data sharing, harmonizing protocols so that everyone is kind of speaking the same language and comparing apples to apples. One of the places you really see this is around neutralization assays, uh, viral neutralization assays for vaccines. Companies were publishing data at a pretty steady clip about their vaccine's ability to induce antibodies and trial participants, and that's great. But the titers are all calculated using different methods different assays with different cell types or different versions of the virus. It's natural that there might be some heterogeneity there, but it, this was really the moment to, I think, pull together on some of those basics. And it was a little disappointing that was not the case. And this is not a new problem for the industry. The industry had this exact same problem with PD-1, where you got gazillions of companies going after it. And when the first ones came out, they were all using different analytical methods. And so physicians couldn't compare across them. And that is something that, as you say, for COVID, it's just like everybody sees everything. <laughs> so everything's amplified. But that is absolutely a problem. It's got to be fixed going forward in terms of drug development, ability to compare across trials. The collaborations went well beyond data sharing. For me, that was one of the coolest things to watch this year. Very early on, I think it was you, Simone, talked to Novartis's Jay Bradner, and he told you something to the effect of, it's quite uncommon for us to call our neighbor Takeda and ask for a stick of butter, but that's exactly what these companies were doing. Bradner mentioned to us that he or someone on his team got a call from Andy Plump, who's the president of R&D at Takeda, and he just said, we've got some protease inhibitors. You're welcome to test them. And they stood up a team in this area right away. Seeing a lot of that happen, I, I think, was really unprecedented. That's one thing that we at Biocentury have had a front seat to witnessing this collaboration with the COVID R&D Alliance. And there have been a couple of others, Steve Usden, who's not a, on this week, but he's also been talking with many of the big movers and shakers in the active trials and so on. And so it's really been interesting to get some of the backstories on that. Yeah. And I guess speaking on, on behalf of Steve, we let him sleep in today. Well-deserved after he wrote some 300 articles this year. His pick was validation of mRNA vaccine platforms that rapidly develop new and highly effective vaccines. And he called this a new page in preventing disease. Actually, I want to ask Lauren very quickly about that. Do you think, Lauren, that's now vaccines going forward? Everyone's going to start with an mRNA? I think it could be. Yeah, I think this year is a big moment for new modalities in general. The, these mRNA vaccines are, have been incredibly impressive, the way they can be manufactured, the way they can be adapted to new indications. I think we'll see what happens as more people are vaccinated, but I, I think a lot more companies are going to step into this space. A lot already have. <laughs> there are a ton of mRNA companies. I'm ex very excited to watch that. Another of our editors who we let sleep in, take a little time off, is my fellow co-host of this podcast, Virginia Lee. 
She has been watching developments in financing for biotechs this year. And, you know, the, it goes without saying IPOs had a banner year in the sector, breaking all records. SPACs made a comeback with specialists at the helm. And each week we saw a flood of new innovative companies. And one way we measured that was in how many emerging company profiles we wrote. And I think we wrote, what was it, Simone, about 20% more than in past years? Yes, we did. So let's get to the bad news here. You know, other the, than the obvious, right? The, other than the obvious. Well, I mean, the death toll, it, it needs to be said, the death toll from COVID-19 clearly tops everyone's list everywhere, and especially here at BioCentury. As of this morning, it stands at 1,767,000 thousand one hundred and eighty seven according to Johns Hopkins that's worldwide yes Center for Systems Science and Engineering's COVID-19 dashboard and it's sobering to think that number is likely already out of date but looking beyond that our, our editors have picked out some of the other collateral damage and other lows from the year and I, I think it's worth briefly touching on this. Simone, I know politics yeah. was on your mind. Yeah, a bit. I have I have three very specific things that has just been in my mind all year long on this. One, it's as a scientist, somebody who's been doing science, I don't know, since I was 16, really disheartening to see the politicization of science. It's been going on the last few years, but this year it just took a new trajectory. And the lasting damage that's happened to public health organizations through that, I don't know how we get back from here. I hope we do. But but that has really been very troubling. I think there are two others on the sort of medical front that I keep thinking about. And one from my recent trip, just stepping away from drug development and just talking to family and friends about theirs and realizing that even among people who have escaped this terrible disease, there is a massive untold mental health burden across the population. It's obviously extreme among emergency workers and the health professionals and people who've suffered the disease, but it's actually also among children and elders and everybody, this incredible burden that this year has put in terms of stress and uncertainty and I, I think we'll be living with this for a long while and trying to unravel that. And one other thing that has just been sort of on my mind, I think there's just going to be a, a large number of undiagnosed cancers. People didn't go to their routine screens. They didn't do the things they should. And there's a reason that we have those screens. And the reason is that we detect cancers and we detect them early. When we detect them early, we can catch them and save people. And so I think that I see these as a sort of ripple collateral effect. I'm going to stop there because I don't want to be too depressing. But those are, those are three things that are on my mind. Karen? Well, it's been disheartening to see how this administration has undermined the pandemic response in many ways. And it might be impossible to list them all. But the one that stuck out to me, sort of with my focus on COVID-19 testing this year is around the pursuit of a deregulatory agenda in the midst of a pandemic. What I mean by that, there's the belief you could reasonably debate about that it's counterproductive to have too much regulation, that you might slow down innovation, you might get in the way of progress. On the other hand, you might say regulation provides really important guardrails for getting things right, particularly in you know, biomedical innovation. And so there is a legitimate place for discussions around what regulations are necessary versus unnecessary. The Trump administration under an HHS under Azar took some actions this year that were pretty perplexing to the testing community, saying FDA had asserted early in the pandemic that while it normally doesn't regulate laboratory developed tests, because of the emergency, the pandemic that was emerging, the uncertainty around it, it, it was going to be reviewing COVID-19 tests that come from individual labs. And there's a longstanding debate about 
whether FDA should be regulating laboratory developed tests versus in vitro diagnostics, the difference there really comes down to is just one lab conducting this test in-house versus is it being uh, distributed as a kit more broadly. Congress is actually on its way to developing some regulation that unifies uh, across the two, but that's sort of a long-term thing that obviously uh, got disrupted like COVID, like many other things. But basically at one point in the summary, Secretary Azar uh, put out a memo that said FDA actually doesn't have uh, the authority to regulate laboratory developed tests for COVID. And it was just kind of a record scratch moment. This was a year that already saw kind of a bit of zigzagging around what is FDA's authority on tests and on different types of tests. It caused FDA to then say, okay, deprioritize, like, all right, we're not even going to look at those. Then the administration came back and said, well, wait, actually, you should look at those. It it was kind of a mess. And it was just a a thing where this is a time where it really should be all hands on deck to do things um, sort of as safely as possible and not really the time to tinker with how much regulation is good or bad. The administration made some of the response more challenging this year. Okay. I'm starting to feel a little gloomy. So I know Lauren and a few other members of our team their pick was the clinical trial disruptions that have hurt patients and companies this year. Any, anything you want to say on that, Lauren, before we try to look for some rays of light? Sure. Well, to try to be positive, I, at the beginning of the pandemic, it seemed like this was going to be a huge widespread problem. I don't know that it was as bad as we expected it to be, but the ones who are hurt by this are the small companies and a lot of patients. You know, we saw clinical trials go on for cancer, but there are a lot of indications where people couldn't start their trials or patients didn't want to go to the hospital if the indications weren't that severe. It's something that BioCentury has followed since the beginning. We've been tracking the clinical trial delays. Unfortunately, we've seen a lot of them start back up, but it, it has been, it has taken a toll on a bunch of companies in the industry. Indeed. Well, sunny side up. Simone? I'm going to go out on the limb here, and I'm going to say that the situation for women in leadership is going to improve next year, that you're going to see greater representation of women um, in executive positions and company boards. You're starting to see that a little bit, and I hope to see that accelerate next year. I think that innovation is going to continue to break boundaries. That has been the trajectory. I think it's fantastic that the BioNTech founders the parents, let's say, of the mRNA technology. One is a Turkish immigrant to Germany, or a a couple of Turkish immigrants to Germany, another Hungarian who really just kept going with that technology. And I think that we're all really understanding that immigration is really important for our business. And uh, that is how you fuel things. I really am hopeful that we will either reopen our borders or continue to keep our borders open for science and global cooperation. That's, yeah, (laughs) well said. I want to rep my fellow executive editor, Selena Koch. Her pick is for investments in neuroscience continuing to rise with a broadening set of mechanisms, including an emphasis on genetic drivers of disease that could finally make inroads into these historically intractable and devastating conditions such as Alzheimer's. Lauren, I know you are the queen of new modalities around here. Any that you're looking for a breakthrough next year? Yeah, I mean, there are already CAR T's on the market, but we're looking forward to the first BCMA CAR T, which these have seen such incredible efficacy. This could be a turning point for that modality. And I think we're also looking for other breakthroughs in other major long-standing challenges that the biotech industry has faced, such as inhibiting KRAS. I guess we'll see what else comes up in terms of tough targets and, and new modalities next year. I think it's also going to be a big proving year for uh, targeted protein degradation. Mm-hmm. Like we've got our Venus's data that's been coming out and sending their stock with it. But I think we're going to see other companies enter the clinic with that modality as well and hopefully see some more proof of concept. A couple of our editors, Virginia Lee and Winnie Pong, they focused in on what they're seeing as potential bright spots in clinical trials. Virginia is looking to see companies 
as we discussed earlier in the pod, taking more and more action to engage, recruit, and better represent racial and ethnic minorities in clinical trials. And she's hoping this translates into better outcomes across the board. Winnie says lessons and advances in trial design, manufacturing, regulatory approval, that, that's a big one there, and collaboration from the COVID-19 vaccine development to speed up other vaccines and therapeutics. I just want to follow up quickly on Winnie's point about manufacturing. I don't know that I'm particularly optimistic for next year, but I'm optimistic that it will gain attention. We've seen this year how important manufacturing is to getting products out, but there's also been a little bit of a battering for some other smaller companies in trying to get their compounds and biologics made. And so that's something we're going to continue to follow up by a century. When we talk to members of small companies, leaders among small companies, manufacturing is one of their biggest concerns. And so that's something that we need to sort of unravel. That's definitely something we'll be watching. One last ray of light to close out the program. Our friends at Kendall Square Orchestra recently presented a benefit concert, Symphony for Science, an online event with music and words. It benefited an organization called Next Step, which supports people with rare diseases, cancers, and HIV. I've heard from them just this morning that the event was a huge success. They raised close to $80,000 with net proceeds benefiting Next Step. And the good news for you, if you haven't seen it, you can still view the event and donate at symphonyforscience.org until the ball drops on, what is it, Thursday, Friday? When is this year going to end? 2021, hurry, hurry, hurry. Uh, You can't come soon enough. All of our podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. And music for all of our podcasts is provided by Kendall Square Orchestra, which connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. Lauren, Karen, Simone, thank you very much. This was fun. And Happy New Year, everyone. We will catch you with our JP Morgan preview next Monday. 